depending upon your leader, alignment is often, for many leaders, it's around vision. For some leaders, it's around the actual measures of success, which we call objectives or goals. But the third is then how you go about doing it, the strategies and tactics. But you can have misalignment at any level. And the result, office politics, baby. Office politics has many root causes, but most can all be compounded into two things, misalignment and distrust. And when those things spread through an organization, the consequences can be severe. And then the result of office politics, the mighty three, worse decisions, less productivity, and way far reduction in alignment and agreement and collaboration working together. There you go. So how do you break through to get everyone on the same page, build those relationships, and subsequently prevent negative politics from happening? Welcome to Strategic Momentum, the pod course with actual tips, inspiring stories, and practical advice from progressive leaders on what it takes to break through business and career inertia and understand the business of work. I'm your host, Connie Steele. Last season on Strategic Momentum, we started our series on understanding and navigating office politics. The first two episodes in the series featured a panel of guests sharing different advice and perspectives. But today, we'll hear from one guest in particular, Michael Wilkinson. Michael is a veteran on the show and one of our favorite voices on leadership and management. He's a master facilitator and founder of Leadership Strategies, the number one facilitation training company in the U.S. In part one, Michael explained how political behavior in the office really comes down to two things, alignment and trust. Today, he's going to walk us through exactly what those look like and how to break down alignment and trust to find the root of political problems and then create your strategy for managing those dynamics effectively. We'll start by revisiting what those politics look like in both the positive and negative sense. So let's first start off by defining office politics. What what would your definition of office politics be? As you think about what happens inside of an office and the negative behaviors that often occur as a result of office politics, they really come down to two things in particular in our experience, and it's alignment and trust. And so let me just say what I mean about those two. See, when, Connie, when you and I are aligned, when I know that your values match my values, or when I know that what you're trying to achieve, your outcomes that you're trying to achieve align with my outcomes, guess what goes away? Politics, because we're trying to work together to achieve the same thing. And so a key cause to office politics is misalignment. When you have sales wanting to do one thing, marketing wanting to do another thing, field operations wanting to do another thing, and then people align with one of those three areas, and then the politics happen. The other really things that happen, the way we define office politics is around trust. Because where there's a breakdown in trust, regardless of the reason, when there's a breakdown in trust, politics happen. I can't trust you, so now I have my favorite people, my blonde-haired child that I want to use all the time for everything because I can trust him or her. Or we have our favorites. We have this. We have that because there are others we can't trust. Or people wondering why they can't get ahead because I can't trust you, however I define trust. So we're talking about both the soft and the hard. So office politics are, starts with misalignment and mistrust, that if we're not aligned on, oftentimes alignment happens on vision. We're misaligned on vision. So office politics happen. Well, he's just trying to do this. You know, we can't. I, also, though, on the softer side of things, where there's disagreement, where there's uh, trust, where there I can't trust your competence. I can't trust your, that you have the skills. Can't trust that you're really trying to do the same thing I'm wanting to do. Don't think you're honest. All those can, can contribute to trust issues. So misalignment, mistrust, key symbols for 
office politics makes it ripe for the game. <laughs> so we say office politics occurs when there are one or both of those two things missing. Essentially, trust comes down to personal relationships and alignment comes down to overarching business dynamics. As we learned in earlier episodes in this series, when people have conflicting motives, they tend to sidestep those who are in their way. And then those trust issues and misalignments worsen and spread throughout the organization. When people and teams aren't on the same page, politics happen. But before we get into how you handle the negative situations, let's understand the scenarios where you create positive movement through ensuring alignment and trust. As Michael will tell us, Sometimes knowing where someone stands could be an advantage in building your village and subsequently can create a positive network effect as a leader. Think about that you are a leader where you're wanting to get together, put together a team that is it to work on a project that's make it or break it for your company. Make it or break it. Well, due to office politics, you happen to know that there are people aligned with this particular solution. So picking people who are aligned with the success of that solution, it's a very positive thing to do. Picking people who are misaligned with that might not be in your best interest. So understanding the office politics around this project can make a difference between how successful the project is and certainly how much in, how much joy, uh, effectiveness, and efficiency the project will have. So that's an example of office politics really being used to actually achieve a positive result. Your knowledge of it makes things happen. At the same time, your knowledge of office politics can also mean that, hey, you know what, we, we may want to choose to put together priorities that make sure we balance the way things happen inside of the office because of the political nature. And we need to, if field operations and marketing aren't getting along, or if sales is having the toughest time getting together with those engineers, then if we have a strategic ledger that all projects that are pro-engineering have nothing to do with sales, that's going to hurt us. So being aware of those politics and using those politics to bring about positive gain can be a good thing. In that positive way, it's about being strategic and building your village. Because if you can find those people who are aligned with you, you are building that village of folks who have the shared vision, alignment, who you trust in order to create that positive movement in a way that can accomplish your objectives. And then, but in turn, when you think about the implementation of it. So it's one, there's the relationship and the people part, but the implementation part of that is then understanding almost that network effect of different functions, how they balance each other and using the positive side of office politics to know the interplay between all these different cross-functional teams to then lead you to the right outcome. Well said. So office politics is a thing, whether you use that thing to positive gain or to have the natural negative comes out, it's really how well you are managing those politics. And so as an individual, I can say, wow, I know that the head of manufacturing wants this to happen. But you know what? I know the head of sales wants this to happen. And so for my career, how do I align myself so I'm maximizing both of those? Of course, now I'm playing political game as well but utilizing office politics in a positive way to bring about results. Now, if I'm the president of the organization and I've got manufacturing trying to do one thing and sales trying to do another thing, I know I've got some strategic alignment to do, that I can use the energy from the both those groups to align around a common goal. And so then we have other work to do. While understanding people's positions can help you build that strategic framework to align teams with tasks, oftentimes the mindsets people have and the affiliations they choose could still result in negative political behavior. Once stubbornness and political buy-in, as Michael will say, leads to poor decision-making and a loss of productivity. We've all seen it. Bunches of things happen where, oh my God, you get 
through because of office politics, you can have great solutions not being implemented because somebody else didn't think of it. You know, it's it's a great idea, but because it didn't come from our area, the answer is no. Or more specifically, because it came from that area, the answer is no. <laughs> and so it's uh, office politics often yield worse decisions often slow things down to a halt where they like to say um, you can run into an oak tree. An oak tree is doing nothing. It's just not moving because of office politics. You run your car into that oak tree, it's going to do lots of damage. Or you may say, let me navigate around the oak tree and think about all the work you have to do just to navigate around it because of office politics. So often you get bad decisions often you get much uh, much slower. You lose productivity because of office politics. So office politics can lead people to not buy into something just because of where they're sitting. It's funny because we talk about politics in this era of heavy, heavy politics among Democrats, Republicans, and so on. We see how politics really plays such a role in helping our government just slow down to a crawl, having our government make worse decisions. As people say, where do I stand? Well, it depends on where I sit. That is office politics in a phrase, that whether something's effective or not effective, whether it's a good decision or a bad decision, if that depends on where you sit and how you're aligned, we have a problem in our organization. So we want to avoid office politics wherever possible. So exactly how do you avoid these politics within your organization? Again, it comes down to alignment and trust. Michael explains how breaking down what they mean first will help you understand exactly where the problem areas are. Let's go to trust first, because that's the harder of the two for people to get their arms around. So, Connie, if you said, Michael, I don't trust you, I can say, really, Connie, what is it? that I'm doing, or what is it about me that you don't trust? And Connie, whatever comes out of your words, what comes out of your mouth next, will tell me which of the five C's we have a breakdown in. One of the things that I love about our company is we take these complex, really hard stuff, trust, ooh, that's hard to understand. We break it down into pieces that people can execute on. So bear with me here. We know that Honey, if you tell me you trust me or you tell me you don't trust me, it's because of one of these five C's. And the order is important. So first, competence. When you, if you say you trust me, it's, it just says you believe I have the skills to get it done. You trust that I can get it done. I have the competency to make it happen. The second C is communication. When you say you trust, hey, listen, when we talk, we get each other. We understand it. We have this little language that we're doing where, hey, you know what? When you say this, I got it. Or the third is commitment. You know, Connie says, Michael, I know I can trust you because I know you're going to deliver. That if you agree to do it, that's all I have to be concerned about because it's going to get done. So we start with competence, communication, uh, and then commitment. The fourth is caring. That Kind of when you say you trust me, it's because you know I care about you. I care about you. I care about what's important to you. I care about making sure you're happy that you get what you need. And then the fifth C, character. When I trust you, it means I know that you have the integrity. You are honest. You are transparent. I can trust your character. Here's what's fun about these five C's. The deeper you go, into what we call it the trust triangle. As you go lower and lower in those C's, the harder it is to fix. See, if you have a competency issue, that's easy. Train them. Well, first of all, how do you know you have a competency issue? Well, you know it. The person's making mistakes. So you train them. You know how to solve that issue. You have a communication issue. How do you know? You have a meeting. You make some decisions. You come back together. You go, hey, well, why did you do this? And they say, I did do it. Well, wait a minute. You said you were going to... No, no, what I said was this. Well, didn't that mean? No, it didn't mean that at all. You know that. Uh -huh. So that when we communicate, it's easy to fix. Let me play back with you what I heard you say. Let me share with you what I'm going to do based on that. So 
So you just communicate differently because you know you have different communication styles. The third C, commitment, wow. Now, the first one, we were talking about skill. The second time, we were talking about just what we were doing when we talked to each other. Wow, now we're down to behavior. Wow. If you go have a commitment issue, it means what's the problem? I'm not showing up. I'm not doing what I said I was going to do. Now you're going to try to change behavior. That's a lot harder than the other two. Oh, but four, the fourth is caring. Oh, my God. Now we're getting into feelings, right? Yeah. Oh, that's really hard to change. But now I have to care about you. And how do you know when you have a caring issue? Well, the person doesn't care about your opinion. How do you know? Frequently, it's because they don't ask. They don't ask questions. They're telling you, well, this is what we're going to do. You're going, whoa, whoa, whoa. It doesn't matter. They do it their way anyway because they don't care about what you think. They don't care about your needs. They don't even ask about your needs. Why? Because they don't care. Changing a caring issue, ooh, that takes a little work. It does. And in the office environment, it looks like, listen, as, as if I have someone who works for me who's demonstrating who I know I can't trust because they don't care about the same things I care about, I ask them, listen, when you come to me with an idea, after you share the idea, I want you to share with me, what do you think I'm going to think about it? What do you think I'm going to say? What do you think is going to be important to me? Because I want them thinking about the questions I'm going to be asking, because then they'll start thinking about and caring about what I care about. Fifth C character, wow, how hard is it to change that, Connie? Oh, my gosh. How do you know you have a character issue? They're dishonest. They're lying to you. So how do you solve that? Wow. Right. You may not like to be say, able to. You may not be able to. It may be time to, as we like to say, free up their future to be somewhere else. <laughs> yes. But uh, we say uh, character issues, if you have a competence issue, you might give it three months. You might give it six months. Do you have a character issue? Give it a weekend. Let the person know, hey, lying is not, not only is it not appropriate here, it's not acceptable. And so I need to know when you come back from, when you come back to work on Monday, I need you to make a choice and we're going to have a discussion about it. Are you going to choose to be honest with me, transparent with me from this point forward? And that because you recognize that any evidence of you doing otherwise are grounds for your immediate dismissal. So it's like we say, if it's, a, if it's a, a confidence issue, give it three to six months. Character issue, give it a weekend. Wow. And to me, when you get down to that character issue, it's really a matter of fit because there just yeah. might not be the right cultural fit, whether it's within your team or within an organization or really within a company. But that's when you have gone through this checklist, as you said, and you can really hone into this very specific profile because... There's, yeah. there's probably an ideal profile that you're looking for. But the other thing that I just well really took away too is that the top two, the competence and communication are hard skills. So we're going back to the hard skills, soft skills. So yes. we're going down nice. the, well said. the skills hierarchy where it's hard skills to soft skills to your own personal values. Behaviors and how you're behaving yeah, you're going all the way. Yeah, it gets there. Yeah. Building trust takes being proactive in how to interact with other people. If you're the recipient of negative political behavior, it may be because of mistrust in one of the areas of the five C's. Competence, communication, commitment, caring, and character. So it's up to you to be mindful about how you go about demonstrating the five C's. Being able to present yourself as trustworthy could be the determining factor between building and burning bridges. And being able to identify which of the five C's is the problem between you and another person or between people in your organization as part of developing that all-important EQ. So that's trust. But what about alignment on the business side? Let's go to the other side, Connie, and talk about alignment. If it's an alignment issue, what is the alignment issue on? Now, this is, think of a strategy now. So if I'm not aligned with you, I could be misaligned because we have a different vision. It could be a vision for my company that, Mike, I want to go one place, you want to go somewhere else. 
We have different visions. We're not aligned. It could be if I'm your employee, it could be we have a different vision for my career. I want to become this. You want me to become this. And we are misaligned in terms of the vision. Second way of misalignment, let's go one level lower. We may have similar visions, but we have completely different measures of success. I may believe if I'm in sales, just to use that as an example, that all I have to do to be successful here is to hit my number every year, year after year. But my sales leader, his measures of my success, yeah, I have to hit my numbers. But also, I have to sell the right products that the company wants me to sell, not sell just the easy stuff. I have to treat my clients a certain way, not just churn and burn. I also have to treat the inside people inside the organization a certain way, being a team player, not just using people to get what I... And all of a sudden, we have different measures of my success. Once more, we're misaligned. And politics happen where... This person's advancing all these people that he likes. He's not advancing me. Office politics, when really it's a measure of success issue. For this person, the measure of success that my boss wants is very different because I'm thinking I'm very successful and he's thinking I'm failing. Different because we had different measures of success. One level lower, we call it critical success factors. We may agree on the levels of measures of success, but we may differ on what is critical to achieving that. And so I may be focusing in on, wow, I believe in order to get better relationships with clients, I need to be on site with them all the time, glad handing, making sure I understand their needs. My boss believes, no, what's critical for your success is not is being responsive. Being responsive to one, every one of their needs, documenting exactly, which means I can't do that if I'm out there all the time being with them. My boss wants me in the office more. You get the picture, Connie. And he wants more. We have misalignment on strategy. Absolutely. And so it really is important to understand that office politics come into play on the alignment side, be it at the vision level, the objectives level, the critical success factor level, or even the strategy level where you can have misalignment, and that yields office politics, which means all the things we've talked about, worse decisions, less productivity, less buy-in. And when I think about this, again, that funnel where you're going deeper and deeper, and it becomes harder and harder to be able to get aligned. It's almost from a strategic view. So first level is being aligned on the strategy, but then yes. your level two and level three really get into the execution of execution. that strategy. Execution, well said. Of that strategy, so, well said. Well said. Or execution different. of the vision, as we like to say. Yes, execution, execution of the vision. Of that vision. So there is the yes. vision, and maybe the next level yes. down is the strategies that could support that vision. And then the yes. third level is potentially the tactics aligned to yes. the strategies, which then aligns go. back up to the vision. Well said. And kind of between the, what you call the strategy and the vision, we call the measures of success. And that's important for people to understand that, yep, for um, some leaders, hey, align with their vision, they're happy, that's enough. For other leaders, yeah, aligning with my vision is enough. You have to align with the specific results I'm trying to achieve, the specific measures of success. Others like, you know what? The measures will take care of themselves. I just need you doing the things I want you to do. Now they're at the strategy and tactics level. So depending upon your leader, alignment is often, for many leaders, it's around vision. For some leaders, it's around the actual measures of success, which we call objectives or goals. But the third is then how you go about doing it, the strategies and tactics. But you can have misalignment at any level. And the result? Office politics, baby, there you go. And then the result of office politics, the mighty three, worse decisions, less productivity, and way far reduction in alignment and agreement and collaboration, working together. There you go. So you missed that buy-in. Well, and then you, 
it results in a lack of engagement and then ultimately, oh, I think, tell attrition, me about it. right? So, attrition, yes. But keep in mind, some attrition, Connie, is a good thing, right? If we are, if we have, if you have someone on your staff, Connie, who's not aligned with your vision, you know, it may be time to free up their future and it would be a good thing for them and a good thing for you. That great worker, they have the competency you need, but they really are trying to push in a direction that you really don't want to go. And you're having trouble getting them aligned with you. Absolutely. Yeah, we find if there's disagreement in the workplace, there's often disagreements that occur are really of someone, uh, employee, boss, employee relationship. It's usually one or two things. There's a lot it could be, but it typically comes down to one or two. Communication styles, they haven't figured out how to communicate, are completely different visions of the outcome. They want different things and they haven't taken the time to agree on the outcome. So they're having all these skirmishes, all these battles constantly because they're trying to achieve different stuff. We say, have that battle once. Make sure when you hire someone, make sure they are clear on the role they're playing to achieving the overall end, making sure that they are aligned with you. That minimizes office politics. To get the alignment going, that is the start. Interestingly so, enough, Connie, you'll find it interesting. One of the strategies we use in our company to get the uh, to get the alignment right from the very beginning and to build the trust. Can you imagine this? Everyone in our organization, every single person, once they get to the sixty day point, they have to. Prior to that, they have to have spent two to three hours um, doing five tasks. I only mentioned three of them just to save time. One is they have to go through our company's strategic plan, identify our five major goals, and they have to write what they are going to be doing in their job to support those five goals. They also have to review our eight values, go through each one of our eight values, and identify what are they going to do on a regular basis to live up to each of those values. And then they also have to go through, we use for communication styles, the DISC model. They have to go through, understand the model, the four basic styles, identify a person in the organization who has each of the styles and what that person will do to adapt to the other person's style when they communicate with them. Then they have a two, after documenting all this, and it's typically a four, five, six page document, they then have a two hour meeting with the managing director to go over each one of those pieces of information they prepared, talk about them, make corrections to them to make sure they understand the company's goals, the values, and so on. Every employee within 60 days of joining us has that session with the managing director. That's our way of minimizing office politics to make sure everyone is fully aligned with the organization and understands the values we hold and how we want them to behave while they're with us. So while trust is broken into the trust triangle, alignment can be seen as this funnel or flow chart where each level depends on the one below it. You have vision, then objectives or measures of success, then critical success factors, those strategies and tactics for getting you there. When there is an issue with alignment, it's because one of these is off. To address those disagreements we often face, it comes down to different visions of the outcome or an inability to effectively communicate between the various parties. So next, I ask Michael to walk us through understanding trust and alignment from the perspective of a new employee in an organization. How do you set yourself up so you're best positioned to avoid situations where you could easily fall prey to being part of the swirl? So you've just joined an organization. You're excited. You want to be there a long time. You want to not get caught up in this thing called office politics. How do you do it? Remember the two things that make up office politics, alignment and trust. So it starts with alignment. So you're going to meet with your boss. You're going to meet with your boss and ask him or her a series of questions. And you'll see where I'm going right away. First question is all about his or her vision. Let's say it's a her in this case. Hey, where do you want to take our department? Where do you want us to become? When you think three to five years from now, what are you looking to do? 
What do you see as your measures of success of making progress in getting there? What are the strategies you're trying to do in our department to make it happen? And then what do you see as my role as supporting you and bringing this about? I think you hear the alignment, Connie, at vision level, measures of success, strategies, then tactics. What do I do to support you doing that? You can imagine a new employee getting that information. Oh, I get what I'm doing. I get why I'm doing it. I get how if I stay aligned with you and what you're wanting to do, big help. I am now aligned with you. Then comes the five C's. Asking, hey, I really need to know what are the things that you want me to be able to do well? The things that I should be looking to improve on as I improve in my career. There goes confidence. Hey, tell me about how to best communicate with you. What's the way? Okay, how do I show that I am committed to us as an organization? What are the behaviors that I would display that, again, you see what's going on. I am now aligning myself around the five C's based on how my boss sees the five C's. Uh, And then finally, now that you understand your bosses, understand the similarly the visions for the other organizations you have to work with. If you're in operations and you also have to deal with sales, marketing, with product development, make sure you understand their vision, their measures of success, their strategies, and what you can do to help support them. It is all about alignment, all about trust. And you as an individual then is taking that into control, taking it into your own hands to make sure you're aligned with the people who are important in your career. I love that because I can definitely see the strategic planning side of all of this, where you are doing a line of questioning that is not intimidating. It is not putting somebody on the defensive. It is all um, inquiring about how you can gain a better foundation of of baseline understanding and engage the political dynamics, if we want to call it, but yes, in a way Connie, I love it. <laughs> in a way that helps you better get grounded in in how to probably move forward. But it also at the same time helps you engender yourself to whomever you're trying to build this relationship. And it starts the initial um, relationship off in a very caring way. From the very beginning. You sound like you're caring. Sounds like you're going. You went right to it, didn't you? (laughs) Yes, those five C's. Absolutely, Connie. It's a wonderful thing. And they get from you, wow, this person is really intelligent, really strategic, really, wow, there's somebody I can rely on to let me watch this person's career. Let me help this person's career. Our company needs more people like him or her. It's a great thing. Absolutely. Because then for me, what you've just done by being able to articulate all these questions and set up all these meetings is you're starting to define your character. So step one, it's almost, you know, from from the person who's starting out, they're going from the bottom up. So, but if you're to solve a problem, you have to go from the top down. So so, so well for, said. for an individual person, it's like you're starting by showing what your character is like, which then shows that you are caring, which then goes all the way up. But that's how you start to manage politics from the very beginning. It's an amazing thing how it works. I mean, it just, it all fits together, doesn't it? Trust yes. and alignment, it all fits together. If I want to borrow from our course called The Facilitative Leader, um, and for leaders who are on the line, please consider writing something called Managing Your Boss. And for me, it's called Managing Your Boss, What to Do uh, If Michael Is Your Boss. And in it are the things that this person needs to know about how to manage me. And it's, it's everything from, hey, if you have an idea, here's how best to present it so that you will be successful. Here's what's really important to me to achieve And here's what you can do to help me achieve what I am trying to achieve. And here is what, if you're wanting to communicate with me, here's the best way to communicate with me. And it's just stuff for 
It's all the stuff that they're going to find out over time. But you as a leader can package it to a three or four page document that they can now, oh, they now get up to speed quickly. Well, thank you so much for your time today. This was amazing and incredible as always, where we get so much systematized insight that I would have never thought of in that particular fashion. Well, I appreciate it, Connie. And for folks who want to learn more, uh, the probably it's three books, depending upon your view. As a leader, uh, my book, The Eight Core Practices of a Facilitative Leader, from a strategy standpoint, it's really the executive guide to facilitating strategy. And if you work with groups as part of what you do, now, my bestseller is The Secret of Facilitation, which is my first book uh, in its um, second version now, but just a wonderful tool for anybody who works with groups and want to be successful with them. Thank you. And we will definitely share those books with everyone. And before I forget, what's the best work advice you've ever received? Believe it or not, it's the, uh, the parachute book. Do what you love and the money will come. Do what you love. Be great at what you love. Great at it. Um, I was facilitating groups long before I learned that you could get paid for it. I was facilitating sessions for my church, for my nonprofit organizations, for my association, and got the call one day that changed my life. Connie Bergeron, 1991, said, hey, would you come facilitate a retreat for me? I said, yes. She said, great. It's this weekend. I said, I'm available. And she said, those words that changed my life. And we'll pay you. What? <laughs> get paid? I would have done it for free. Get People get paid for doing this? Oh, this is wonderful. And she called me back three months later, mentioned the pay word again, called me back two months later. I was November 15th, 1992. I was 18 months from becoming a partner at Ernst & Young. And I turned to Ernst & Young and said, I'm having way more fun on the weekends and started this company. And today, where that was 1992, today we're the largest provider of facilitation services, facilitation training. I've written six books on the topic. It's crazy. You do what you love, the money will come. That's awesome. I love, I've always loved hearing your story. Well, thank you so much. And um, what's the best way listeners can connect with you? Yes, our website, www dot lead strat short for leadership strategies leadstrat.com or just google michael the facilitator you'll see me and for those of you who didn't catch our original podcast episode with michael which was all around you know navigating your organization for success you could check that out and it's a fantastic fantastic episode to help you better understand facilitation and really the strategic aspects of it Thank you again, Michael. Always a pleasure, Connie. Look forward to talking again. What I found so valuable in talking to Michael is that there's a simple and systematic way to break down a political situation. Earlier in my career, it felt really complex and trying to objectively understand the what and why behind people's actions wasn't immediately obvious. That's something I had to learn over time. That's why learning Michael's approach to diagnosing and addressing the root causes is a great tool in the toolkit. It's something that we can all leverage to help us navigate the sticky and tricky circumstances we inevitably end up facing at some point in our careers. So remember, there's the relationship part, which ties to challenges with trust. Those five C's, competence, communication, commitment, caring, and character can help you determine whether it's a skills-based issue or something much deeper. And then there's the business side, where an alignment to vision, measures of success, or critical success factors come into play. Whether it's the vision itself or execution of that vision, that misalignment can happen at every level. So it's important to figure out where the breakdown occurs, but also try to get everyone on the same page from the start. To sum it all up, when you can match one another's values and expected outcomes, and have confidence with their skills and methods of delivery, you're likely to minimize and manage politics. Thanks for listening to the Strategic Momentum Podcast. To connect with Michael, visit leadstrat.com. That's L-E-A-D-S-T-R-A-T.com. Or search Michael the Facilitator online. Get show notes, links, and more tips and advice from this episode, you can visit us at strategicmomentum.co. 
There, you can contribute your own tips, the great work and career advice we've collected over the years. If you've liked what you heard, please share this episode with a friend. If you want to hear more from Michael on facilitation, leadership, and virtual meetings, check out episodes 45, 46, and 69. And tune in for part four of the Office Politics Pod course in the coming weeks, where we'll examine how gender plays a role in understanding and mastering office behavior. We'd love for you to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And follow Strategic Momentum on Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn, and join the Strategic Momentum Facebook community. I'm Connie Steele, and you've been listening to the Strategic Momentum Podcast.